Professor Dave here. Let's look at coordination compounds. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. Normally, when you see stock images of chemistry laboratory equipment, it's filled with a variety of brightly colored liquids. This is very misleading, as most chemistry does not look like this. It's just to make the image pop. But there is one exception. The ions of certain transition metals and the complexes they form can have very vivid colors. What are these complexes? They are called coordination compounds, and they make some fascinating structures. So let's learn about them now. Coordination compounds are compounds in which a central metal ion acts as a Lewis acid, and a certain number of ligands, each with some electron excess, act as Lewis bases and coordinate to the central atom to form a complex. These ligands can be atoms, molecules, or ions, but they usually have a lone pair that can coordinate to the electron deficient metal ion to form what is called a coordinate covalent bond, sometimes also called a dative bond. These are different from the ionic and covalent bonds that we are used to. With coordinate covalent bonds, both of the electrons in the bond come from a Lewis base and are being donated to a metal center, like the lone pairs on each of these water molecules, which interact with the central metal ion to form this octahedral complex. If we want to show the coordination sphere, or the metal ion plus its ligands, using our standard notation, we will do this by placing brackets around the complex, as is shown here. Outside of these brackets will be listed any formal charge exhibited by the complex. The coordination number is the number of donor atoms that are bound to the central atom in the complex. So that would be 2, 4, and 6 for these three complexes respectively. With these situations, all the ligands are monodentate ligands, meaning they interact with the central atom through one atom only. Ligands can also be bidentate, such as ethylene diamine, whereby both the nitrogen atoms on each ligand will interact with the metal atom. So in this case, even though there are three ligands, the complex has a coordination number of six. There can even be polydentate ligands, where interaction with the metal atom occurs in many places. These can sometimes be called chelating ligands. Hemoglobin is such a ligand because all four nitrogen atoms in the heme are coordinated to the iron atom. So technically, this is a tetradentate ligand. Coordination compounds are fascinating structures that display a wide variety of geometries. What determines the type of geometry that a coordination compound will exhibit? More than anything else, that would be the coordination number of the compound. Once again, this is the number of donor atoms that are interacting with the central metal atom, or in other words, the number of coordinate covalent bonds that are being made to the central atom in the complex. There are a few types of geometry that we will see over and over again, as they are the most common. These would be octahedral for complexes with a coordination number of six, as well as tetrahedral and square planar, both for complexes with a coordination number of four. But we can have coordination numbers well above six, and these will generate some interesting geometries, like pentagonal bipyramid, square antiprism, and dodecahedral. Many of these do not follow the geometries expected from the Vesper model due to details regarding non-bonding D electrons. As we mentioned, a few coordination numbers offer more than one option for geometry, and the geometry adopted by the complex will depend on the precise set of ligands involved. Octahedral complexes with a coordination number of six are very common. In this geometry, all the bond angles are 90 degrees. Going back to compounds with a coordination number of four, once again, both tetrahedral and square planar geometries are possible. We can't predict which will occur by Vesper. 
we will have to use crystal field theory in order to predict this. And the factor that is largely responsible is the number of d electrons in the valence shell for the central metal atom. But we will get to that in a moment. Beyond understanding the geometry of coordination compounds, we also have to be able to name them so that we can communicate concepts about these molecules. The rules for the nomenclature of coordination compounds are as follows. First, if a coordination compound is ionic, we will name the cation first and then the anion in accordance with typical nomenclature rules. Second, we will always name the ligands first, and we will do so in alphabetical order. Once these have all been named, then we will name the central metal atom. So what are the names of these ligands? Well, for neutral ligands, it's easy. These will just be the normal name of the molecule that is acting as a ligand. However, there are some common exceptions to this rule, including water, ammonia, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen monoxide, which as ligands will be called aqua, amine, carbonyl, and nitrocele. For anionic ligands, these will end in the letter O, and the names will be quite intuitive, like fluoro, bromo, and the rest of the halogens, as well as others like cyano or hydroxo. The third and final rule is that if a particular ligand appears more than once in a coordination compound, we must specify this using a special prefix indicating the number of times it appears. Sometimes these prefixes are modified if the ligand itself begins with one of those prefixes or a vowel so as to remove ambiguity, resulting in the prefixes bis, tris, and so forth. Now to put things together, when the complex as a whole is a cation, we will list the metal by the name of its element followed by a Roman numeral in parentheses to indicate its oxidation state. So as we can see in these examples, the ligands are listed first, with prefixes as necessary to indicate the number of them, then the metal ion with its oxidation state, and then any counter ions to the complex if applicable. When the complex as a whole is neutral, we will follow the same rules as for cations, and in this case, there necessarily will not be any counter ions to list. When the complex is an anion, however, we will have to add the suffix eight to the metal, giving us things like platinate instead of platinum, and so forth. With stannate, we will see that sometimes the Latin name is used for the metal atom instead of the name of the element itself. Let's try an example, Na2PtCl6. First, let's assess the charges. Sodium ions are plus one, so that's a total of plus two, meaning the complex itself has a minus two charge as a whole. Each chloro group is minus one, so six minus ones will need a plus four on the platinum to get to minus two, so platinum must have an oxidation state of plus four. Now we just list everything. Six chloro ligands gives us hexachloro, then platinate with the Roman numeral four, remembering that because it's an anion, we use the suffix eight, and then sodium at the beginning to list the counter ions. So that's a little bit of introductory information regarding coordinate compounds. Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.